What's up, ladies and gentlemen? Welcome to the show. As always, thank you for tuning in. And it is Super Bowl Sunday. Sunday, Sunday. <laughs> you know, I'll be honest. I used to be a super, super football fan. Um, I mean, I, I still play fantasy football every year. And, and in fact, I honestly, I, I don't even think I'm going to play it next year. Um, but I am watching the Super Bowl right now. It's right. It's on right in front of me. Um, I actually think it's going to be the 49ers that take it. However, I don't like making predictions because by the time you listen to this, Super Bowl would be over. But I predict 49ers got the better team, but you cannot pass on Patrick Mahomes. Never bet against that guy, man. So, you know, I say it's probably going to be 49ers. They have the better player. I think they'll pull it off, but we'll see. I may be wrong as you're listening to this. Um but I honestly have not been into football at all this year, which is really weird for me. And honestly, it it I stop I, I lost interest in football right around when all the BLM stuff started, all the virtue signaling. I, I don't know why. I mean, call it petty. It, it's I it, it literally just ruined the game for me. It really did. Now I'm still interested. I think it's an, an incredible sport. Um, I just, uh, and you know, like I said, I still played fantasy for a couple years and I probably won't next year. I, I just don't have the time. I love football and I'll watch it when I have a chance, but I haven't watched almost no football this year. I don't know. I'll be honest. It just ruined it for me. The BLM stuff, the virtue signaling. Um, we got a black national anthem now after the national anthem, which, you know, it is just so degressive. To me, it's um, it, it to me it seems like it takes the country back. Um, it's a constant reminder of you know the bad thing that happened in this country, and it wasn't just this country; it was the entire world was going through slavery, and you know the United States fought a war to abolish it. To me, we're all Americans here, no matter what your color is, no matter what your religion is. If you are an American citizen, you are an American. And so I think there should just be one national anthem. I think having two, um, not only is it very counterproductive, but it, and it really doesn't even make sense. Number two, I find it just very divisive. I Frankly, it, it's one of the big reasons why I don't even watch the NFL anymore. Taylor Swift is way, she is, she is way oversaturated right now. She is freaking everywhere. She was on tour. I feel like Taylor Swift has consumed our entire society. I've never heard, I've never heard more non-football watchers talk about football in my life. People that don't, they don't watch football at all. They don't know nothing about the game, but yet they're talking about NFL and Travis Kelsey and, and Taylor Swift and it is the best marketing idea ever. Whoever Taylor Swift's agent is, bravo, bravo, because they killed it. the The American people they can be they can be oversaturated with a certain person or certain celebrity. Um, a, a lot of people, and I, I fear that that's what may happen to Taylor Swift. I think she's kind of too in society, like she is too. She is she's in the picture too much. Um, she, everybody's talking about her everywhere you look. Every news article, Taylor Swift, 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 Swift. And I think it, I think there's a, a way you can overdo it. And the American people are kind of just get exhausted of the Taylor Swift. And honestly, it's the last thing that Taylor Swift needs. So I think her her marketing team, uh, which I think may be an agent, I, I don't know. I'm not a celebrity, so <laughs> I have no idea how this works. But there is um, people that sign her deals. They get her contracts. They do her tours. They tell her what media appearances to do. And all this is set up. I think this is somehow set up some way um, to as a marketing scheme. And it couldn't have worked out better for the NFL. Anyways, um, if you plan on calling out for work tomorrow because you got smashed tonight and you have one of the worst hangovers you've ever had in your entire life. This is why I don't drink anymore. You're not alone. There's actually a lot of people <laughs> that call out. It is the number one most called out work day all year. 
And uh, millions of Americans plan to miss work Monday after the Super Bowl. This is an article from USA Today. This just came out a couple days ago. Around 16 million American employees plan to miss work Monday, February 12th, the day after the Super Bowl 58, according to a survey of 1,192 Americans conducted January 10th through the 12th. However, these results are down from last year when 18.8 million employees said they plan to miss work the Monday after the Super Bowl. These absences are known as the so-called Super Bowl flu, (laughs) and 9% of those surveyed have admitted they've called in sick to work the Monday after the Super Bowl when they weren't actually sick. One in 10 of those were managers. Great. So it's going to be complete chaos for all of us people that do go to work tomorrow. (laughs) So more than one third of survey respondents said the day after the Super Bowl should be a national holiday. I agree. I think there's certainly something that can be done. And I'm going to talk about that if this article doesn't go into it. Um, Quote, this person says it's a national cultural phenomenon for sure. And it's a day when people are with their family and friends and neighbors and groups and bars for hours. And on the East Coast in particular, the game ends really late, Chris told CEO of UKG. But for Super Bowl Monday to become a reality, Congress would have to step in and pass a bill. Juneteenth, June 19th, was the last date to become a federal holiday, commemorating the symbolic end of slavery in the United States when President Joe Biden signed the bill. Even still, it's up to each state to determine its legal holidays. Um, Yeah. So it didn't actually go into my suggestion, and it's not just mine. I think there was this petition that was going around a couple years ago to actually change the Super Bowl to make the Super Bowl on President's Day weekend. So you'll actually move, which is next weekend. So this is why this petition went around, and I think there was millions and millions of signatures. So instead of Congress having to pass a bill because we all know they're about useless – Wouldn't it be easier for the Super Bowl just to move it back a week and then you would have President's Day on that Monday so you wouldn't have people calling in sick because they would already be off on that President's Day? I personally think that is the best thing to do, and I honestly can't see any downside to it. it. Granted, it would give them instead of a two week break from the final playoff game until Super Bowl. It would be a three-week break, so the players would be well-rested. Of course, it would extend the overall length of a season. Maybe they can work something out, take a season away earlier in the in the um, or take a week away earlier in the season. I don't know. To me, it just seems like it makes more sense to just move the Super Bowl back a week, right? I mean, you want to sit here and pass legislation, you know, have Congress vote on a bill to to make. Super Bowl the day after Super Bowl, a national holiday, or how about the NFL just moves the Super Bowl back one week and then boom, you got President's Day after the Super Bowl. Sounds pretty uh, logical to me, but we'll see. I actually do think this is something that's going to happen in the future. It's just a matter of time. Um, That petition never went anywhere. Um, I seen the last time I read about it, it had millions of signatures, but the NFL obviously didn't buy it. They're not they're not budging. So we'll see. I think they're going to budge eventually. I mean, because think about that, folks. 16 million people are not going to work tomorrow. I mean, that has to cause some type of economic impact. It has to. I mean, because 16 million workers not going into work for one day, that's insane. And so what you'll have is you'll have All these people getting paid if they have sick leave, which I'm sure a lot of them do, but you'll have no productivity. And so for the day after the Super Bowl, you have all this money going out, paying employees to be at home sick, and there's almost no productivity for that day and probably lags trying to catch back up. So to me, it just seems like move the freaking Super Bowl. That's it. It's simple. Move the Super Bowl a week. Make everybody happy. Um, no, no people going to work the next day hungover. You don't have people stressed out driving home drunk so that they can go to bed because they got to wake up the next morning. I mean, to me, it it would just solve so many problems. It's, it's an easy solution, easy fix, easy peasy lemon squeezy. So anyways, enough about the Super Bowl. I have found this wild, wild news story. 
And I and I got to say, it reminds me a lot of the Ray Epps situation when it comes to January 6th. So a couple days ago, some J6 footage came out. New footage kind of just came out out of nowhere. And it's actually footage of a J6 protester climbing up on the scaffolding and firing his handgun into the air. Now, this is really weird to me considering how um, and we're going to get into that in a little bit, and you're going to see just how ridiculous it is that they're actually calling this an insurrection. So this was actually footage of somebody firing a handgun into the air. But here's the kicker. That person still has not been charged. Almost three years later. No, it is three years later. Three and a half years later, still has not been charged. Very weird. You're going to be hearing about this all week. This is one of those things that go right along with the pipe bomb story, right along with all the other theories, conspiracies that we have when it comes to January 6th, because it just doesn't make sense. And, you know, the media wants to call this an insurrection. You know, they want because it's a legal term. They want to they keep repeating the word insurrection because they want to turn it because insurrection is actually a legal definition. It's a legal term. And so, you know how the media is, they brainwash their viewers by just repeating stuff over and over and over again. And so I just find it very odd how the one person that actually shot a gun there on January 6th, minus the, the guy that murdered Ashley Babbitt, the Capitol Police officer, him and this person that shot their handgun up into the air are the only two people that fired guns that day. <sighs> and yet this person has not been charged. This is weird. They got him on camera. They know who he is, but he hasn't been arrested and charged. Very weird story, folks. I don't know what it means. We're going to have to wait till some more details come out about this. I got an article here from NBC News. New January 6th footage appears to show rioter firing a gun in the air during the Capitol attack. And so newly unearthed footage from January 6, 2021, appears to show a rioter, a man identified in an NBC News story nearly two years ago, firing a gun into the air outside the Capitol during the attack. Online sleuths, who have aided in hundreds of January 6 prosecutions, say he is the same man they identified to the FBI who is currently individual number 200 on the Bureau's Capitol violence page. And, you know, that same page, that Bureau's Capital Violence page, Ray Epps was on that page for about 24 hours, and then he was removed. Ray Epps is a very, very weird, weird situation. Almost as weird as the J6, the pipe bomb story, which you can go down that rabbit hole, and I think we may have a couple weeks ago. And that story just makes no sense at all. I mean, every time you get an answer to something, you, it just gives you more questions <laughs> like it is. And one day we're going to find all this stuff out, folks. This is this is the this is the good thing about alternative media. One day we're going to get the answers to this. And that is the benefit of alternative media, because if all we had was the legacy media, the corporate mainstream media, we would only know what they wanted us to know. And as of right now, the entire country would think January 6th was an insurrection because that's exactly how they wanted people to think. And but not now with alternative media. And we're going to find out all these answers that we have about the pipe bomb, about the, the J6 of Fed surrection. <clears throat> was it a false flag operation? I seem to think so. That, that is my firm belief that it was some type of false flag, inf uh, false flag operation. Who conducted it? I don't know. Who is responsible? I don't know. Who was involved? We don't know. How many officers were there that day undercover? We don't know. These are the answers the American people are searching. This is what the, Ameri the American people deserve to know these things, but yet they don't want to tell us. And there's a reason why. Uh, the, the, you have Yogananda Pittman that you know, was sitting on intel, vital intel, that Steve Sund, the chief capital lieutenant, uh, overseeing then not just the not just the lieutenant but the chief, the capitol police chief overseeing the entire capitol police was not giving that was not given that intel and then Tyreek Johnson who was the capitol police lieutenant who was in charge of the senate and the uh house um 
the the uh, certification vote that day. He wasn't given that intel. So the two people that needed the intel the most never received that intel. And Yogananda Pittman had that intel for a long time from our intel agencies, but sat on it. So these are the types of, you know, very, very peculiar, uh, very, very odd circumstances when it comes to January 6th. And this person firing a gun into the air is you can throw that right into that bin of question marks. <laughs> very, very odd conspiratorial kind of situations. And so <clears throat> let's see here. So he first appeared on the Capitol violence page three years ago. Videos and photographs from the Capitol on January 6th showed him with what appears to be a gun in his waistband. As NBC News previously reported, the man, John Emmanuel Banelos, I think that's his name. I don't know. It's B-A-N-U-E-L-O-S. I'm probably pronouncing it wrong. So my apologies. So so Emmanuel Banelos told Salt Lake City Police that he was at the Capitol and had been captured on film with a gun. So he told police this. <laughs> OK, so he told Salt Lake City Police that he was at the Capitol on film with a gun. He said, quote, I was in the D.C. riots, he told the investigators, according to a police transcript. Quote, I am the one in the video with the gun right here. So apparently he showed him he showed the police who he was. Bonellos has not been arrested or charged in connection with January 6th. The Salt, Lake, the Salt Lake City Police had arrested him in connection with a fatal stabbing of 19-year-old Christopher Thomas Sen in a park on July 4th, 2021. So a few months, what was that, January, February, March, April, May, June. So six months after the January 6th riots, he stabbed somebody to death. <laughs> it's quote, man, should I just tell the FBI to come get me or what? He asked the Salt Lake City police officers, according to a police transcript. Weeks later, Bonellos called an investigator with the department and said, quote, and quote, talked about going where Donald Trump sent him. This is weird. Let me repeat that quote. Talked about this is what he said. This is what he told the investigator. He talked about going where Donald Trump sent him. Now, that sounds very, very odd, folks. Did Donald Trump send people there? That sounds like somebody that is very, very, um, what can you say, trying to put the blame on Donald Trump by with, with those words, saying that Donald Trump sent him there. I don't remember Donald Trump sending anybody anywhere. And in fact, the last I heard of Donald Trump saying what in regards to going to January 6th was telling people we're going to march to the Capitol peacefully and patriotically. And so how this guy got this, it doesn't even sound like something a Trump supporter would say. You know what I mean? So you mean to tell me this is a Trump supporter saying that Donald Trump told him to go there and fire off a gun into the air? Mm, folks, it doesn't make sense. And it gets weirder. So apparently referencing the Capitol, according to a police record, the Salt Lake City DAs did not pursue a case against Bonellos, who claimed self-defense in Sen's death, which was the person he stabbed six months after January 6. So now, footage released by another January 6 rider appears to show Bonellos firing the gun into the air twice during the chaotic scene on the west side of the Capitol as rioters battled with police. Online sleuths also surfaced U.S. Capitol Police surveillance footage previously released in connection with another Capitol attack case that shows the man... They've identified as Bonellos, appearing to fire the gun. They found multiple other videos in which the gunshots can be heard. The footage is the first showing a rioter firing a gun on January 6th. The incident took place at 2.34 p.m., which is about 10 minutes before an officer inside the Capitol shot and killed Ashley Babbitt. I will say murdered. Um, murdered Ashley Babbitt as she jumped through a broken window leading, to, leading into the speaker's lobby. Uh, she was unarmed. This person now has a lawsuit against him by, um, uh, what's his name, Tom Fitton at Judicial Watch. They they are suing the government for the actions of the Capitol Police officer that murdered Ashley Babbitt. And so that's going to be interesting. No investigation was done into this guy. They just said, oh, you shot, you shot and killed Ashley Babbitt. You shot and killed an unarmed woman, a veteran. No problem. No investigation here. You can actually, I think they actually gave him a medal, if I'm not mistaken, which is, 
my God, folks, um, the incident with the gun, sh- the incident with the gun outside the Capitol was not previously known to online sleuths. And I, why do they call them sleuths? I don't know what that means. Were these just people like just helping the FBI, <laughs> like trying to, you know, trying to narc out their fellow Americans? I don't know. What is a sleuth? I don't know. So the Capitol was not previously known to online sleuths and has never been mentioned in any court filing at the time and location at the time and location where the shots appear to have been fired. The Capitol grounds were in chaos. The law enforcement firing their own non-lethal rounds of of crowd control munitions following sustained repeated assaults on officers, which could explain why the sound of two gunshots didn't grab much attention. Despite repeated false claims from conservative media figures, that the mob that stormed the Capitol was unarmed, a multitude of defendants were armed with deadly or dangerous weapons, including several who carried firearms, as the Justice Department has proven in court. No, I don't think anybody... Listen, what what conservatives are trying to say is that that was not an insurrection, okay? Like, this is the problem. They're trying to turn January 6th, and they have been from day one. You know, when they... Look how many times they've got caught in lies when it comes to January 6th. The deadly insurrection. Officers beaten to death on January 6th. None of it's true. None of it's true, folks. And here we are three and a half years later. And they're so desperate to call this an insurrection so that because it's a legal term that they can use to stop Donald Trump. This is what the media does. They work in – they are a the, – the media and the government have a symbiotic relationship. And they work together. And in some ways, I can't I can't tell who controls who. Does the media control the government or does the government control the media? It's hard to tell. They're so intertwined. It's such an incestual relationship that I can't even tell which is which now. The the media is is an official arm of the administrative state now. But I want to get into these armed rioters. This was not an insurrection, folks. So I want to go into who was armed that day and what kind of guns did they find on them in what situation. You know, just like with everything, there's context. There's context and there's nuances to everything. All right. So somebody that was carrying a sidearm on them because they didn't know the laws of D.C. or whatever the case is or had firearms in their truck, wherever their truck was parked. That counts as being armed, according to the media. That counts as being an armed insurrectionist that was trying to take over the Capitol. That is what the media is referring to. <clears throat> and I actually looked this up. I wanted to see how many people have been sentenced for having guns that day. And when they say a handful, it's a handful, folks, out of the hundreds of thousands of people there, a handful. So a January 6th rioter who carried the two loaded handguns on U.S. Capitol grounds during the insurrection was sentenced to 60 months in jail on Friday after pleading guilty to assaulting an officer that day and unlawfully carrying a firearm. Mark Mazza, 56, entered the Capitol grounds armed with two handguns, one of which a revolver called the Judge loaded with shotgun shells and hollow points and hollow point bullets. He lost on the lower West Terrace just outside the building. He lost his gun. After losing the gun, Maza joined the mob in a tunnel leading inside the Capitol, a scene where the police were brutally attacked for hours by rioters armed with bats, poles, chemical spray, and the other and and the officers' own weapons. Yeah, I've been looking through this footage in this tunnel. You want to talk about straight up just savage beatings by police? These police went unhinged on some of these people. They killed they killed a woman. I can't remember her name. They, they, they killed her. They knocked her out. And then one of these officers was beating her in the face while she was knocked out. She ended up dying. Nobody knows about that. Nobody hears about that. The media doesn't mention that, does it? I think you had a lot of police officers that got wrapped up, too, in that mob and brutally beat people with batons and sticks and, and so on and so forth and just complete I mean, barbarism on some of these protesters. I watched one video where a protester was in the fetal position in a corner getting beaten. And then when the beating stopped, he tried running away and the officer grabbed the shirt and slung him back into the corner where then a few more officers continued to beat him, beat him, 
beat them with sticks and batons. Yes, this is what we're talking about. And so when I tell you that the American people are not getting the full picture of January 6th, we're not getting the full picture of January 6th. And were any of these officers investigated? No, they were given medals. That because they did what the Democrats wanted them to do, savagely beat Republican protesters, Trump supporters. And I'm sure a lot of them got joy out of it. I'm sure a lot of them enjoyed beating them. You know, now all these Capitol Police officers, they're they're not Republicans, folks. You got one Capitol Police officer. I, I can't remember his name. He's actually running for Congress now. He feels like he is so badass. Like he... He wants to be so famous. He wants he wants to dedicate himself so much that he wants to run for Congress. Um, and he lied under oath. And in my opinion, he lied under oath. And I think he should be investigated, too. Um, and in fact, I think that's why he's running. But that will save that for another story. So during the attack, Maza, still armed with his second pistol, according to prosecutors, took a baton from one officer and used it against him. Quote, this is our effing house, Maza yelled after the attack, after attacking the officer, according to his, according to his plea agreement. Quote, we own this house. We want our house. Get out of the citizens of the United States way. I think I was saying pretty much that I think I say the same thing uh, quite often, actually. Um, that is our house. Um, they are in our way. And we do want our house back. So, you know, I could see this guy, you know, I am not sticking up for people that are violent. This guy, I don't see anybody defending this guy. I haven't met one person who has said that the people that were violent that day hitting police officers should be let out of jail. No, they are getting exactly what they deserve. I'm talking about the thousands of other people that just walked through open doors or in some cases were waved in by police. It was, listen, there was nuances to January 6th. You know, not everybody was violent that day. And this is the problem. When you have Biden's DOJ just casting this wide net over thousands of Americans and then the media calling them all insurrectionists because they want this to be an, ins- in, they want it to be an insurrection. Uh, dressed in a force green prison jumpsuit, Maza told Judge James Bosberg on Friday that he, quote, got caught up in the mob mentality that I never anticipated. I'm not quite the monster the government painted me as, Maza added, saying that he had never intended to fight police that day and left the tunnel as soon as he realized what he was doing was wrong. Maza also claimed that he assisted other officers outside of the tunnel. Quote, the tale you have, the tale you have to tell is a familiar one, Bosberg told Maza adding that it was the decisions people like you made to assault the Capitol in what was a true insurrection. Boom. There you go. These judges are out of control, man. These judges are out of control. This judge knows that insurrection is a legal term. So why is this judge adding these types of comments? Why are they commenting like this? It's because these judges, they have Trump derangement syndrome too. They cannot remove themselves from their emotions. They can't get a grip. And so they want to punish people that voted for Donald Trump. That's what they want. And I'm not saying that this person shouldn't be punished. I have a problem with judges being getting, getting emotionally involved in these cases and calling it an insurrection when it was not an insurrection. That's what I have a problem with. I respect law and order. I do not respect these judges making comments like this. And this is, folks... This is just a tiny piece of the comments we've been hearing from judges. You want to talk about Trump deranged judges. Look at some of the comments these judges are making to these um, to these these prisoners, these people that are that he's that 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 they're sentencing. Some of the most egregious stuff I've ever heard. Chutkin's one of them. There is a lot of judges making some very, very um, just very extreme comments. For judges, they know better, but they cannot get a grip on their Trump derangement syndrome. Uh, Boesberg added he was alarmed Maza had brought two firearms with him and that while Maza claimed he was only armed because he heard Washington, D.C. was the murder capital, the mall and Capitol building are not dangerous areas. Well, I mean, he just didn't teleport into the mall and Capitol building. Of course, people had to park their cars and walk there and he wouldn't be wrong. Washington, D.C. is a freaking crap hole. It is one of the most 
Um, it is one of the highest murder rates in the country. And so he's not wrong. The problem is, is Washington, D.C., you're not allowed to have firearms there. That's where these people got caught up. And that's as I read through this and you go through all the people that had guns that day, you start to see that all these people that had guns, it wasn't that they had them because they were trying to overtake the government. They weren't going to fight the military with them. They had them either A, they were carrying them for their own self-protection and didn't think they would get caught. Or B, they had them and didn't realize that they had them. In some cases, you had people that got locked up and charged with ha for having guns when they had guns in their truck. And you have the media calling them insurrectionists. How are you going to take over a government, fight against the government's military when your gun is in the truck? <laughs> this is what I'm saying. I think a lot of these people... Um, but that you can tell, obviously, they're concealed carry holders and maybe didn't realize that D.C. is a non-carry or they knew and didn't care. You know, a lot of these people, they're firm believers of constitutional carry. They'll take their damn gun everywhere. And I know a lot of people like this, but they'll take them across state lines. They don't give a F. They're taking their pistol with them. And I think you had a lot of these people here. There's no doubt that, you know, Republicans and Trump supporters are more um more supportive of the second amendment you know and they're more likely to practice their second amendment so you know the handful of people that had guns it's not what the media is making it out to be um I, it's you had some people arrested for just having a a magazine in their truck and and I think I read one story where a guy got arrested for having guns in his home he wasn't even there they arrested him and said oh you have these guns in your safe, yes. Well, then we think you probably most likely brought them to the Capitol. What? So they got arrested. Yeah, I was trying to, I, I, I guess I could try and find that story, but um, there's a, there was a lot of situations like that. That's, that is what that was. Um, so here is a running list of gun arrests tied to the U.S. Capitol attack. So this is the latest one I could find. This was updated June 15th, 2022. So the January 6th insurrection wasn't explicitly billed as a Second Amendment event, but the spectator of guns were everywhere. On the flags flown by rioters and the insurrectionist theory they, were, they espoused and the, tactical, and, the, and the tactical gear they donned, and in some cases, despite Washington, D.C.'s unusually strict gun laws, which require firearms to be registered with local police, the Trump supporters who gathered at the U.S. Capitol were armed. As of now, at least 13 people have been hit with illegal gun possession charges stemming from the riot, according to an analysis of arrest records and court documents. Two of them were detained after police noticed a bulge under their clothing. Three people were arrested the night before the riot. Another person, Proud Boys leader Enrique Tario, was found in possession of two large-capacity magazines when police arrested him for another crime on January 4th. Because Tario planned on going to the rally, we included him in our tally. Yeah, this guy, uh, Enrique Tario, wasn't even there that day. And this guy's doing like 18 years in prison. Wasn't even there. And he was found with two, ex uh, two large capacity magazines. What is that? Extended mags? 13 rounds, 14 rounds. This is how, this is the nuances I'm talking about. There's context to everything. But these are only the people who were caught with guns that day. We'll never know how many people brought weapons with them to President Trump's speech and onward to the Capitol, perhaps cognizant of the penalty for carrying a gun without a license in the district. Uh, yeah, up to five years in prison. Only a few felt comfortable enough to display them. One rioter flashed his handgun at a group of journalists, a moment captured by a vice reporter. So you have Henry Enrico Tario. He was caught with M4 30 round magazines branded with the Proud Boys insignia. That's actually pretty cool. I'd like to get me some of those. Harlan Bowen, 48. He was arrested near Freedom Plaza on January 5th by a Metropolitan Police Department officer who noticed a bulge on his hip. So, again, probably carrying, didn't actually care about the laws. A lot of these people carry, anyways, because they are firm believers in their constitutional right to keep and bear arms. And so they don't give a flying rip. They'll carry them everywhere. I actually know several people like this. So you have Thomas Groneck. He was stopped. Uh, 
So he was a half a mile from the Capitol on January 5th by Metropolitan Police Department officers who stopped his bus. Upon a search, they found a Springfield XDS handgun, a pink 22 caliber rifle, and 110-round drum magazine, four 9mm magazines, and 270 ri- 275 rounds of ammunition in his bus. So... I mean, was he planning on taking over the government with a 9mm handgun? Or how about a 22? <laughs> he was going to take over the military and our government with a 22? You see what I mean, folks? And this list goes on and on. I'm trying to find the one where the guy was actually arrested at his home. Um, he agreed to let agents search his trailer parked outside, and they found a Glock 19 uh, and more than 2,500 rounds. Listen, folks, it is standard operating procedure to have at least 1,000 rounds per firearm. Uh, that is something that I was told by, by a very wise man in the chance that we have some type of apocalyptic event or type of end world scenario. They say 1,000 rounds per firearm. And listen, it's not it's not unlikely for people to have thousands of rounds of ammunition because, listen, you go to the range, you're burning up 500 rounds easy in an hour. Easy. I mean, you could burn up five, six boxes of of nine millimeter handgun rounds in an hour. No problem. So twenty five hundred rounds sounds like a lot. But, you know, a lot of people that have firearms, they carry a lot of ammo. I mean, I'm not saying they carry a lot of ammo. I'm just saying, like, wherever their firearm is. They like to keep a lot of ammo. Um, So if this guy was living out of his trailer, which it sounded like, uh, probably a, um, probably a, uh, like an RV, he probably had all his firearms with him. Um, Unfortunately, can't do that, man. Not in D.C. (laughs) Um, Let's go here. Like, so I guess, so there was 13 people. I was trying to find the one that actually got arrested having guns in his home. Who didn't even have a gun there that day that they know of, but I can't, I, I don't know. There's, there's a lot there. There's 13 there, but I can't, I can't find the story. Anyways, this guy that fired the gun off in the air, two rounds, this is bizarre. And the, like I said, the, the first thing I thought of was Ray Epps, the, the Ray Epps kind of thing. Like, because you notice when you watch the video and unfortunately we're audio only, so there's no point in me playing the video because you can't see it. Um, which I hope to change. I hope to change soon. We'll, we'll just leave it there. It's very weird because he climbs up on the scaffolding with, and it looked like he had a purpose. Like his purpose was to climb up the scaffolding, shoot twice into the air and then climb down. Like that's exactly what happened. And so I just find it, you know, very, everything is just so freaking weird, man. Like the, the, it was this guy an Antifa member. Um, he stabbed somebody six months after January 6th, obviously not a good person. Listen, this, this does not sound at all. It does not fit the description of a MAGA supporter. I'm sorry. It just doesn't, man. People, Trump supporters were not there for violence that day. All right. The hundreds of thousands of people that showed up, they were not there to conduct an insurrection against their government. Did they want their house back? Were they, were they chanting, this is our house? Yeah, because it is. That's how a lot of Trump supporters feel. They feel like this is their government. It's their house. It's their Senate. Their taxes pay for it, and they want it back. They feel like it's been, you know, it's been stolen from them. So, And then obviously that election, which we all know is an extremely shady election. We all know it was rigged. We all know Joe Biden did not get 81 million votes. Folks, no one is going to convince me Joe Biden got 81 million votes. I am sorry. Not here, not in this life, not, or in the next. Nobody's going to convince me Joe Biden got 81 million votes. I'm, it's just not going to happen. Look, what you're watching right now looks like an illegitimate presidency. You're watching what happens when somebody got elected that shouldn't have got elected or got elected by fraudulent means. Joe Biden was never supposed to win that election. He won barely by 42,000 votes in like three or four different states. Joe Biden was not supposed to win that election. And this is exactly what happens when you have a stolen election. You have very, very harsh consequences. And Joe Biden runs this country like an illegitimate president. He just does. He doesn't act like he was he was elected legitimately. 
He doesn't lead like he was elected legitimately by the people. The whole cabinet is a freaking disaster. It's like a it's like a bunch of high schoolers are, are running our country right now. And this is exactly what you're watching. It's why you're watching all the destruction around us. I mean, so nobody's going to convince me Joe Biden won that election. And nobody's going to convince me that guy that fired off two rounds into the air was a Trump supporter. I'm sorry. And especially the comment he made to the to that police officer that I was just going where Donald Trump sent me. Does that sound like something a Trump supporter would say? Does it sound like somebody that some does it sound like something a protester would say? No. Because Donald Trump didn't send, he didn't send anybody there to shoot off guns into the air. All right. Everybody that watched Donald Trump's speech knows exactly what he meant. All right. They're trying to, they're trying to change and warp the, they're trying to change and warp the narrative of January 6th by saying, oh, Donald Trump was giving out dog whistles. So when he said march peacefully and patriotically, he actually meant the opposite. It's like, what? These people are nuts, man. But they, they know Donald Trump was not inciting any insurrection. They know this. But they also know that the only possible, possible chance they have of defeating Donald Trump is through lawfare. I mean, they openly admit it now. I mean, all over the media, all over social media, all over Twitter, Facebook, they're literally saying, if Donald Trump does not get convicted, he's going to win the election. And so they're putting all their eggs into this conviction basket. Folks, that is politicizing and weaponizing the justice system. You can't do that. You can't use the law system and because you, you know you're going to lose an election. Like, this has gone way too far. I mean, it is... We have, we are way beyond the the line here. I mean, we have crossed the Rubicon like a hundred times now. <laughs> We're so far past the Rubicon that you can't even see it anymore. The Rubicon is in the horizon. You're not going to be able to convince anybody that this is not lawfare being used against Donald Trump. And you're having, you're going to have a hard time convincing people that Joe Biden was elected legitimately. And what I find, what I find very, very, and I have a theory. I'm, I mean, I'm just going to go ahead and give him, give you my theory now before we end off the show. Democrats, and I want you to prepare for this because I'm making a prediction, and I, I'm telling you, I, I feel pretty good about this one. Democrats are going to challenge the 2024 election in the exact same fashion and form that they are trying to arrest and imprison Donald Trump for. They're going to issue alternate slates of electors. They're going to do exactly what Donald Trump did. Mark my words. They're already getting ready for it. I listened to some audio of Jamie Raskin. Jamie Raskin is essentially saying the quiet part out loud that because they were unable to remove Donald Trump off the ballot through their little schemes of the 14th Amendment, Clause 3 or Section 3, they're going to wait until he gets elected and then they're going to and then they're going to challenge it using the 14th section 3 of the 14th amendment you wait and see i'm telling you i'm telling you they're going to issue alternate slates of electors the same thing they're arresting all these people down in georgia for the transition integrity project did almost the exact same thing in 2020 with John Podesta, we did a show on this where they had a they war gamed the entire election out. And one of those war games in a, in a scenario, they called it, was to issue alternate slates of electors. In the case that Donald Trump won, Joe Biden, the Transition Integrity Project, they had one of these scenarios where they issued alternate slates of electors. They were going to challenge the 2020 election the same way Donald Trump did. But yet it's Donald Trump and all the Republicans in his orbit that are being indicted for it. Now, come 2024, when Donald Trump wins, they are going to challenge the election the same way Donald Trump did. Watch, watch. I'm telling you, man, I could see it already. I'm pretty good with these predictions. I, I'm, I think I'm pretty accurate with the Michelle Obama prediction. I think I'm pretty accurate with this one. And I've been pretty accurate so far up until now. The only one I was not accurate and I'll admit to was the Ron DeSantis. Yeah, I, I you know, that to me is uh, the likelihood of that happening is is diminishing more and more every day. 
I I, th- I truly think so because you have the problem with both of them being in the state of Florida, and Bush and Cheney did it. What you know, they were both from Texas, but Cheney actually put up his house. Uh, he actually put up his house for sale in Texas and and uh, bought a house and got a driver's license in Wyoming or something like that. Utah, one of those Wisconsin, one of those states up there where he had a winter home. And so I don't see Donald Trump. You know, he's a res- he's a res- he's a, he is a resident of Florida right now. And so is Ron DeSantis. So I don't that the likelihood of that is diminishing every day. So I don't know. I think, you know, his best bet is to do a unity ticket with JFK uh, because Donald Trump is going to have to unite this country somehow, some way. And in, in, in all reality, it's not going to be that hard because the people are so desperate for unity right now. They're so sick and tired of the bickering. They're so sick and tired of this division. They are desperate for unity. And I think right now is the perfect time for a unity ticket. Call me crazy, but I think an RFK Jr. on a Trump ticket would probably get a lot of votes, uh, a lot of Democrat votes too. A lot of people like RFK. And it's unfortunate that the Democrats have essentially took all uh, they they've t- they've taken any chance of him running as a Democrat away um, through through lawfare through legal through through legal challenges in states they're not letting him run as a Democrat in certain states they're they essentially crown Joe Biden as their candidate and so nobody else matters and so RFK Jr. is trying to run as an independent he tried running as a liberal he's got he's jumping through all these hoops just like Donald Trump is he's got to deal with the Democrats lawfare and their their election shenanigans too just like donald trump so i think them two together on the same ticket boom and they call it a unity ticket it hasn't happened since abraham lincoln and i think he chose johnson as his vp and that was uh he was a democrat Uh, lincoln was a republican don't i can't uh don't quote me on the name johnson but i think i think that's what it was it was the last unity ticket we actually had where a republican picked a democrat for his vp so we'll see. We'll see. I think that would be a stellar move by Donald Trump. It would bring unity to this country. We have to unite, folks. And you, we can unite around this country, just like we always have. America is our country, and we're all Americans. And it's the one thing we all have in common, is we're all Americans. That's what makes this, so, this, this southern border thing so devastating to people. Is because they just feel like they're being they're being inundated and flooded with people from all around the world that we have no idea who they are, where they came from, what their intentions are. They're here. They're being mailed out and shipped out all over the country. They're being given money. They're being given shelter. In fact, they're closing down recreation centers in Boston so that they can house illegal immigrants. And so the 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 young black kids in that community lost their rec center. So that the city could turn it into a a housing for illegal immigrants. And so what happens to all those young kids? They're probably going to go join gangs, start shooting each other. This is we talked about this a couple weeks ago. And people are starting to see the damage from Democrats ideology. Just like I said in the very beginning, it's all connected, folks, full circle. It's not a Joe Biden problem. This is a Democrat Party problem. There's a lot of issues we're facing in this country. Morality. We are facing we're facing a moral crisis. We're facing a a virtue crisis in this country. Most of all, virtue. We are virtue covers a lot in the framers. It is so, so necessary to have virtue in this country. The Constitution and the rule of law is only paper. In you, you, you need virtue in people to uphold that paper, to follow the rule of law. And so as virtue starts to diminish in their country's population, as morals start to degrade, you start to see chaos in our society. You see the collapse of a civilization. And the only way we're going to get something like that back is through unity, prosperity. I said this from day one. Prosperity brings unity. Disparity brings division. And right now, the people are very desperate. And so desperate people do desperate things. And a lot of times it causes division, period. I mean, that is, it's just my theory, what I'm saying. I think prosperity 
brings unity. When people are happy, when they have money in the bank account, when they can go out to eat with their family and go to movie night, <clears throat> they can go bowling with their family. People tend to be a lot more kind of just chill, a lot more happy and more kind to their neighbors. They're more willing to to give a lending hand. You know, it's just like when a, a homeless person asks you for money, when you're like flat freaking broke, doesn't it kind of like I mean, it doesn't irk you. It doesn't make you mad, but it's just kind of like, dude, I'm sitting here trying to survive myself and you're asking me for a dollar. Like it, people get frustrated. However, and both sides get frustrated. The homeless person gets frustrated because he didn't get a dollar from you and you get frustrated because you just got asked by this guy and you're having the bus and you just got done busting your ass for eight hours at work and you still don't have money. And so when people are prosperous, you would have been able to give that homeless person a dollar, right? He would have been happy. You would have been happy because it would have filled you. It would have rewarded you. It's self-fulfilling to, to give one another. It is. And so to me, my theory is prosperity brings unity. Donald Trump could absolutely unify this country through prosperity and normalcy. And then as a society and culture, as a society and civilization, we could start rebuilding our culture our, our, we could start rebuilding our morals. We can start rebuilding our values and our virtues. It's not going to happen overnight. Like I said, what the damage has been done is generational damage. It's going to take a long time to build these things back. But prosperity and unity is the only way we're going to be able to start working on those things together. Um, and the Democrats are just going to have to learn the, you know, these fascist Marxists, they're going to have to learn like no go here, man. No bueno. You cannot have this here. You want Marxists and fascism. You're going to have to go to a different country. The crime is going to have to get tampered way down. Prosecutors and police are going to have to be able to do their jobs and start cleaning up these streets. I just watched a video of a kid or, or I don't know if he was a kid, a, you know, a, you know, a dude went into a Apple store with his hood on, not even trying to hide from the cameras and ripped all the phones off of their stands. You know, the little they're attached to the wires, the display phones. I'm talking like 40 phones, people. He stole like 40 grand worth of phones and just walked right out the door. And the kicker to the story, and I'll post this video on my um, social media. The kicker to the story is that when he walked out the front door, there was a police car right there parked in front of the store. He got into a car, drove off. This is the type of stuff people are seeing. This is what makes people desperate. Like, my God, not even the cops are going to protect us. Not even the cops are going to stop that man that just robbed 40 grand worth of iPhones. And so what happens? The stores close. Because of the stores closed, now the people don't have an Apple store to go to. And this is happening all over the country, all in blue states, by the way, not in blue states, but blue cities, Chicago, Boston, New York, uh, L.A., California is riddled with it. All the blue cities, it's all crime is off the chain. And so fixing that, you're going to bring prosperity. People, you're going to bring sanity back to the communities. I'm, I am a firm believer, folks, that we just have to do the opposite of what Democrats have done in this country the last 10 years. That's it. We have to go the opposite direction. What we're doing right now is unsustainable. And it's unsustainable. And I think they know it's unsustainable because, again, I believe their end goal is to completely destroy this country so that they can rebuild it. They want to refound America in the in their own image they want to rebuild from the ashes the only way to do that is with somebody like trump to go in fix this stuff you know bring a democrat onto a vp ticket now you can you know a lot of people say they don't trust rfk he's an environmentalist nut okay but he's just vp he's not president all right we'll see and if he ends up being a complete nutso then you got donald trump as president Big deal. I'm not saying we're voting for RFK for president. And then when the time comes, you know, Donald Trump, you know, I don't see RFK being I, I do. I, I really do truly think the guy cares for this country. I really do. I'm not saying like I don't think he's like some deep state plant that's, you know, that's being run by George Soros. I, I really, truly don't think that maybe. But from what I gathered, I think he truly genuinely just cares about this country. He's a Kennedy. 
You know, I, I don't know. I could be wrong. I don't know. But it would be something like that. Donald Trump needs a unifying term. He needs to unify this country. It's the only way we're going to be able to fix all the disasters the Democrat Party and their, their ideology has caused. So we'll see. We'll see. I'm going to pay attention to this shooter on January 6th. You're going to be hearing a lot about this. Uh, this is bizarre. I think we deserve answers. And it just like, what? What is going on in Congress and these House Oversight Committees? Like, why did nobody, why did nobody hit on this? Like, what's going on? Like, you had this dude admit to the Salt Lake City police that I was at January 6th, showed them on video, like, hey, that was me right there. And they don't charge them. They don't make connection. They don't make contact with the FBI, the, the Bureau's violence page. Like, none of it makes sense. Just like Ray Epps doesn't make sense. This guy... I mean, come on, man. Come on. Three years, this guy fires a gun in the air. He's not, been arrest he's not being arrested. I said my theory about two weeks ago in, in one of the shows. I think a lot of the undercover provocateurs, we'll just say, a lot of the, prov a lot of the provocateurs on January 6th, I think were Antifa that got caught rioting and burning and looting. I think they broke the law back in 2020 during the summer riots. And I think the FBI or, you know, this cabal of people that was behind this false flag operation hired them and used them as these provocateurs. So I think a lot of these provocateurs that were there on January 6th, I think they were Antifa members that were just covering their asses, working with the feds or working with whoever it is, the CIA, FBI. I tend to think it's the FBI, maybe higher. They're working with them so that they can get their sentences reduced or probably even wiped clean. They're not going to come out and admit that because they probably were threatened by law. They were probably threatened by the Bureau saying, if you come out and you say anything about you working for us on January 6th, we'll lock your ass up and throw away the key. You'll never see the light of day again. And so you're not these people are not incentivized to come out. Because it would most definitely help Donald Trump and d help Republicans. And I'm sorry, folks, but Antifa is not MAGA. They are not Republicans. Those were Democrats. Every single Antifa member voted for Biden. They're Democrats. Every BLM member is Biden. They're Democrats. And so I think that's who the FBI used. I think these provocateurs on January 6th were former Antifa or BLM members that got caught during the Summer of Love, the 2020 riots. And that would explain why we haven't had any of these provocateurs come out. And I think the footage that we've seen from the Metro police officers with their body cam, I think those were real police officers. I think they did. I think the FBI did have real undercover agents there that day. The, as far as the numbers, the quantity, I don't know. I would probably say in the hundreds, possibly. But I think the provocateurs were the Antifa. Because if you think about it, they can't really get in trouble. If you had a cop, you know, fire a gun off into the air. If you had an FBI agent, you know, con you know, committing illegal acts to incite the violence that day, they they're gonna know. It's gonna be on record. There's gonna be a paper trail. They're, they 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 can't engage in illegal activity. That's I mean, that's like rule number one for being an, a, a a CI or a undercover agent. You're you're you work for the FBI. You're just undercover. And so I think by them bringing on somebody like Antifa as criminal informants that ladies and gentlemen is how they got their provocateurs and trust me they know how to provoke a crowd that they're antifa they know exactly what to do and someone's gonna have to explain to me who is paying for all these hamas signs all these pro-palestinian pro-hamas uh signs that are all over in these protests happening all over the country these signs are huge somebody they're these signs cost thousands of dollars that they're using I mean, these aren't just like little card pieces of cardboard signs. These are like 50 foot by 100 foot cloth signs that they're dropping down on the sides of buildings and inside inside city halls and stuff like who is paying for these signs. And I think I found out and I think we all know. And that's exactly what's going to be on the next episode. So make sure you tune into that. I figured I'd just kind of tease that a little bit. Make sure you tune into the next segment tomorrow. We're going to talk about who is behind uh, who is behind all this uh, uh, pro-Hamas, pro-Palestinian, who is funding the pro-Hamas, pro-Palestinian protests? Um, because like the old saying goes, follow the money. And uh, 
and you'll find out exactly who's behind all this stuff and why. And that's what we're going to get into on the next segment. So as always, thank you guys for tuning in. I know the show went a little bit longer than usual, but uh, I appreciate you guys tuning in. If you could, I'd appreciate it. Follow the show on Rumble. Uh, It helps out a lot. I want to get as many followers as possible on Rumble. And uh, that way we don't have to post anything on YouTube anymore. But until that happens, you can still find the show on YouTube and you can find the show on all social media platforms and podcast platforms. All you have to do is put my name in a search engine, Stephen with the V, T-A-U-R-I-E-L-L-O. And we'll see if my prediction's right. I say 49ers are going to win the Super Bowl. We'll find out by the time you listen to this, I'll either be right or wrong. I think 49ers have the better team, but you can't bet against Patrick Mahomes. So we'll see. All right, ladies and gentlemen, I hope you guys had a good weekend. Happy Monday. I hope the hangover's not too bad. And I'll talk to you guys here in a little bit. God bless you. God bless America. You guys have a good one. Bye-bye.